very pleased to introduce Dr. John Verdefe. Dr. Verdefe is the incident manager for all CDC polio eradication activities and the chief of the polio eradication branch. Although based in Atlanta, John's duties take him far and wide to develop and coordinate polio eradication policies and activities with other major partners of the Polio Eradication Initiative. In particular, these include World Health Organization, UNICEF, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and of course, Rotary. Since January 2017, John has also served as the chairman of the Polio Eradication and Outbreak Management Group within the Polio Eradication Initiative. John was well prepared for these duties by his work with the CDC Country Directorship of Haiti, dealing with HIV and leadership post-hurricane and earthquake recovery activities. Dr. Verdefe was also the CDC Country Director in Tanzania, directing a staff of 65 with a portfolio to tackle major public health problems of HIV, TB, and malaria. Prior to leading CDC activities in Tanzania, John was also the CDC Country Director in Nigeria for three years. As many folks working on polio know, Nigeria is one of the key proving grounds for confronting polio eradication challenges. As many folks working on polio know, Nigeria is one of the key proving grounds for confronting polio eradication challenges. In fact, Nigeria was John's first CDC assignment. One could say that his experience in Nigeria laid the groundwork for his work today. Polio eradication efforts have made great progress, but the last mile is always the hardest. I want to welcome John to speak with us now to update us on the successes of polio eradication and to inform us about some of the recent achievements as well as some exciting new developments. Welcome, Dr. Verdefe. Let's jump right into this <laughs> after a bit of a bit of a, um, a slow start. Okay, great. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, what's going on with polio and also um, how COVID has impacted some of our work as well as our path forward. Um, just to remind folks, uh, I'm not going to read each of these, but um, these are the things that by the end of the um, by the end of the presentation, you should be able to identify as part of your uh, your uh, continuing education. Um, uh, credit uh, activities. And I have nothing uh, to disclose related to this presentation. So I wanted to start first with just a bit of a, a global update, and I'm going to try not to, to go uh, so deep into the numbers that, it, that everyone uh, glazes over, but I think it's important to provide a little bit of context. Um, this uh, map, while it, it may look a bit small on your screen, is, is um, a real challenging map for us. It, it represents a, not a good year for polio um, on top of a year last year that, that really uh, had things uh, already in, in a difficult uh, situation, particularly with Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, to date in 2020, we've had 120 cases of wild polio virus type 1, um, all of those occurring, of course, in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, and we've had uh, the, the, the bigger story maybe uh, for this year is the green dots that you see all over Africa and uh, in Asia and also the Middle East. And that, that's circulating vaccine derived polio. Um, and we've had 406 cases of that thus far in 2020. Uh, th that compares to um, uh, 90 at the same period last year for circulating vaccine derived polio. The vast majority of, of those are type 2, uh, which of course is the type of polio that we had removed uh, the, the um, the, the live vaccine in, in 2016 and globally uh, from provision in routine immunization um, because uh, it's been a long eradicated wild virus. Um, and uh, subsequently, we've, we've had um, uh, the immunity in the communities, particularly in areas in Africa and, and other places has waned. Um, and as a result, um, we've started to see uh, these outbreaks. Uh, and with COVID, uh, the outbreaks have accelerated considerably, both in numbers of countries, but also in the numbers of cases that we're seeing. Um, I also just thought it would be useful because we're in a, a global state of immunity, uh, glo sorry, global state of emergency related to, uh, to COVID to remind folks that polio eradication remains a global public health emergency of international concern. Um, and it has been for many years, and this was reaffirmed again in June of this year. And there's a recognition that 
um, that uh, getting to the end of polio is critical and, and the global uh, global public health um, agencies are all united in that and WHO continues to uh, confer this emergency uh, status um, on polio eradication and CDC remains activated and has been for uh, since 2011 for uh, polio as an emergency response and, and in my role there I play the dual hat of running the polio branch but also serving as the agency's incident manager uh, for the polio response. So I'll talk a little bit about the wild virus uh, and we'll start with some good news. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have seen this uh, certificate or one like it uh, previously uh, but this certificate was uh, was signed on August 25th, and it is the certification of an Africa free of wild polio virus. And so there are six WHO regions in the world. Um, uh, un until this year, four of them had been uh, declared free of wild polio virus, and Africa now has come off the board and is the fifth. Um, the, the certificate is one thing, but it's a culmination of 20 years of very hard work. Um, to, to get across that line in Africa and really is, uh, even in the context of a difficult year for polio, a very important uh, milestone that's worth celebration. Uh, and that milestone is, of course, a credit to the frontline workers and the survivors of polio and the champions of polio who have kept it on the forefront in, in all of the countries in the Africa region uh, and invested their, their time and their energy and, and sometimes given their lives uh, in the pursuit of a polio-free uh, Africa. So we're really excited not to have wild polio virus in Africa anymore. Um, just to orient you related to, to the timelines uh, uh, associated with that, uh, there's been no wild polio virus reported in Africa uh, since uh, September of 2016, and that last uh, report was from Borno State in Nigeria. Um, four countries uh, had to, had to um, at the beginning of this year, present their credentials um, and their data to, to be thoroughly reviewed by the certification committees, and that was successfully done. Um, and um, other countries had to recertify their data. So all of this is sort of the work behind the scenes that goes into the signing of that certificate, but really a thorough process that gives us, uh, give us, gives us uh, confidence in the absence of wild polio virus and, and allows us to celebrate that achievement. Uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan, therefore, remain the only two countries where we have wild polio virus. Um, currently, we have widespread transmission both in Pakistan and in Afghanistan with uh, 120 cases from the two countries um, compared to 82 at the same time last year. You can see from the dots, and I apologize that the maps are a little bit small, uh, Pakistan is the country on the map on the, on the right-hand side and Afghanistan on the on the left-hand side uh, um, with the border sort of following up across uh, where you see that yellow, um, that yellow area and moving up from there. Um, and um, really what you should take away from the map is that uh, there's transmission in a lot of regions of both countries at the moment. Um, particularly hit is the south in Afghanistan uh, where, um, where um, there are um, anti-government elements that control large geographies and that don't permit um, polio vaccination uh, often, um, and therefore uh, a lot of children who haven't had access, millions of children actually, who haven't had access uh, to polio vaccine in quite a while. Um, and, and so uh, real efforts in Afghanistan at the moment to, to re-engage, to identify new ways to get in and vaccinate those, uh, those children. Uh, in Pakistan, um, you have a, a, a fair amount of transmission in the Quetta block and in Karachi in the south, uh, but also in other parts of the country. And, and really right now, the, the Pakistan program focuses on a transformation that allows them to, to re-engage with communities and to create strong new partnerships with a, a Pashtun-speaking um, minority community that's often underserved, uh, underserved and that uh, has very high proportions of of the polio cases seen uh, occurring uh, in those communities. Um, I also wanted to just sort of talk about that graph on the bottom, and I don't want to be alarmist with it, and so I want to say in, a, in advance that it is a model, and it is a model that shows us what would happen if we just didn't vaccinate anymore for polio uh, in the context of in the context of this wild polio virus spread. And you can see that um, it, it seems like a no brainer, but it's worth stating that the modeling shows that we would have a lot of cases by the end of 2020 
and more uh, in 2021 if, if we did not vaccinate. Uh, and these are some of the assessments that we put together when we were trying to determine what the right approach was um, uh, on the basis of having paused polio vaccination in field activities early in the COVID uh, outbreak, uh, uh, pandemic rather, uh, and, and then assessing when and how we should come out and start vaccinated, vaccinating for polio again. The last thing I'd point out from this slide is that um, it's not readily noticed from the from the dots on the map, but we also have co-circulation of wild poliovirus type one and circulating vaccine derived poliovirus in Pakistan and Afghanistan. And the countries are actually uh, going to be using a, a, a trivalent uh, oral polio vaccine uh, starting next month uh, to uh, combat that so that they can give protection against type one, two and three of polio simultaneously as they do this outbreak response uh, and continue to fight Right there, endemic transmission of WPV1. Uh, shifting now to uh, the outbreaks uh, and talking a little bit more about these vaccine derived outbreaks that we're seeing. And so we have these widespread outbreaks. And in fact, um, there are now 26 countries that are fighting circulating vaccine derived poliovirus. Uh, I mentioned that earlier that there were 406 um, uh, cases of CVDPV this year. Uh, just to quantify that all but, uh, all but um, I believe it's a really uh, a very large CBDPV2 outbreak that spans uh, Africa as well as um, Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, the Philippines, and Malaysia. Um, uh, as I mentioned, but I didn't put a date on it in March, uh, the decision was taken uh, to, to pause all polio field activities uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and the decision to do that was absolutely necessary and the right thing to do at the time. We had little understanding of how COVID was uh, acting and behaving, except that it was expanding rapid, rapidly uh, globally and causing, uh, causing, um, causing uh, considerable amounts of mortality. Um, and so we had to stop, uh, but then very quickly we had to uh, get on to uh, understanding what the what the, the, the limitations in that stop were going to mean in terms of expansion of, of polio um, in the geographies that had circulation, as well as where the, uh, where the uh, what was gonna be needed to restart activities. Um, and uh, I think I will move on to the next slide. There's some other details in here that are country specific, but I think we, I think you can, you get the main point that we have a lot of uh, transmission um, uh, going on in, and a need to, to get back to vaccination. Um, talking about a little bit more about the, the, what specifically is happening in the context of COVID, just to quantify a little bit the point I just made about delays, uh, we've actually had uh, rounds uh, postponed in 27 countries. Uh, this is a combination of IPV rounds, BOPV rounds, and, and uh, monovalent uh, type two rounds uh, of which uh, which are used for these outbreak responses. Um, and so um, that's uh, constituted not just 27 uh, rounds, that's 27, uh, that's 20, 27 countries and 34 rounds that have been impacted. And you can on the right side of the table see that the distribution uh, is in several, uh, several uh, geographic regions of WHO, uh, but uh, predom uh, pre predominantly Africa has been hit quite hard. Uh, and we, of course, are extremely concerned about uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan, given the co-circulation of CBDPV and wild poliovirus. Uh, unfortunately, the, at a time when, uh, when we know that the lack of vaccination is impacting the spread in a negative way, uh, we're also not seeing as well. Um, because of the specific nature of the shelter in place and the way that polio is reported in its surveillance system, uh, and as well as uh, interruptions in global transportation networks and even local transportation networks that impact the ability to get samples from the field or, or the hospital where the child is seen uh, to the laboratory where polio is tested, we did see considerable declines in polio surveillance um, uh, because of COVID. So there are decreases in case detection in several, uh, several of the WHO regions, that's the Wipro, the Sierra, the EMRO and the Africa region. Um, <clears throat> we saw um, uh, stopping of environmental surveillance in several countries in Sierra and EMRO as well. And so if you'll recall, we, we do 
paralytic polio um, uh, surveillance through our AFP system, but then we supplement that um, with uh, environmental surveillance so that we can see if there's any transmission in communities that that um, may not have uh, uh, demonstrated uh, paralytic cases. Um, and so that was impacted as well, that environmental system. Uh, and we've had major disruptions in the shipment of specimens. And now a lot of these things have, have started to come back online. Um, and so we're, we're now dealing with a, a combination of uh, trying to prioritize uh, samples that will give us the most information quickly because there is the backlog of samples that we need to get through as we've been able to, to open up um, these transportation routes again. So uh, in, early in the um, pandemic, we, we thought about what are the phases that we're going to need to go through in polio to ensure that we don't, um, that, that we get back out as quickly as possible and that we manage our activities appropriate. And so we came up with three phases um, and that was really the emergency phase where we stopped these SIAs. Um, we, we continued to, to stress the need for surveillance and we also jumped in and helped and I'm going to talk about this in a minute uh, quite a bit in the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, but then a resumption phase and we're, we've entered that now. Um, we haven't entered it uniformly everywhere, but the resumption phase is a time when we're getting these SIAs back out um, and we want to jump uh, very quickly into very rapid outbreak response where it's uh, possible in the context of COVID uh, and where we start resuming uh, activities to, to fight wild virus in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Um, and then uh, there will be a third phase, uh, and we're not exactly clear when that will happen, but it will happen as a COVID vaccine starts to roll out around the world, um, when we start to see considerably lower COVID risk in, in geographies um, and uh, modifications to our strategy, that, that, um, which is underway already, um, that will uh, say to us, okay, uh, what was the, the uh, immediate and, and sort of first year, first year and a half impact of COVID, where does that leave us with regard to the polio um, uh, epidemiology and what do we have to do to finish? And so we'll be revising our end game strategy as, as part of this process. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how, how um, polio, the polio program uh, supported early and, and pretty broadly the, the COVID pandemic response. So when they decided that we had to halt um, uh, polio um, vaccination uh, for a period uh, in March, the Polio Oversight Board also um, used that as a call to action and committed that polio assets should uh, help, help countries rapidly respond to, uh, to the unfolding COVID pandemic. And, and they stressed that we should help support surveillance systems, uh, data management, uh, getting information out, uh, and in fact, uh, within a month, uh, over 31,000 staff and contractors uh, around the world who are uh, polio staff and contractors were contributing in dozens of countries uh, to the COVID response. Uh, and 3,500 community mobilizers were used in Afghanistan, 20,000 in Nigeria. These are just some numbers, but many, many, many countries where this happened. Um, in the course of doing that, I think it really was a, a spearhead for many countries in terms of their ability to roll out responses, uh, but also a, a number of polio staff uh, were, had, have contracted COVID and unfortunately were aware of two deaths uh, in, uh, in the polio staff community um, related to acquisition of COVID as part of the pandemic. Um, and then um, we also have been very actively, because we have such close ties to the community, very actively um, participating in providing appropriate and accurate COVID information and also correcting misinformation uh, as it comes in. And this became really critical in places like Pakistan, um, where uh, there's a broad reach to, to uh, tens of thousands of religions, uh, religious influencers and, 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 and a thousand journalists uh, and bloggers were mobilized to, to really get messages out quickly. Uh, in addition, the polio call center was, was used there um, in, in a few places to actually help uh, as hotlines in these countries so that the communities could get accurate information quickly. So in May, the, the um, guidance from the Polio Oversight Board was updated and it promoted at that time with, with a 
better understanding of what was happening and also the look at how polio was being impacted by not doing campaigns, uh, the resumption of SIAs. Um, and so this was based on a risk analysis that showed that polio transmission was intensifying. Uh, it also was done in, with the context of uh, now understanding how we could uh, increase the safety of frontline workers and other things that we could do um, to, to minimize the risks of going out and resuming polio activities. And so this includes the provision of personal protective equipment for the polio teams. Uh, it includes uh, additional training. Uh, it includes um, concepts like not uh, having communities mix. And so, so the modeling told us that, um, that things were safer if you didn't bring people in from the big cities into the small towns or the small towns into smaller villages, that if you actually use the local communities, uh, you would uh, reduce uh, the risk of, of, of moving COVID around uh, in trying to roll out polio response. And so we're quite comfortable that, um, that um, while there is a residual risk, uh, that we could resume activities in a safe way in the context of COVID, uh, and that on a relative balance, the things that we were seeing with polio transmission, particularly in places that had outbreaks, um, were, were really needed to be addressed quickly, uh, as quickly as was, was possible to put when we put those safety measures in. Um, and so um, following that, there was a, a, a preparation for the rollout of these campaigns. Um, and this is an example showing part of Africa. And uh, there was a lot of technical work um, to look at the political dimensions of doing this, uh, guidance uh, for how to, um, how to monitor uh, preparedness and safe resumption of activities. Uh, there were updated risk assessments because the, the outbreaks were in different places epidemiologically. Um, as we're resuming than they were when we stopped in March because of that spread. Um, and there were uh, approvals for uh, increased, and typically they were increased sizes of response across uh, large geographies so that we can get in front of this transmission. Um, and so I, I didn't, I guess I didn't put a slide in um, related to this, but I, but I will say that, and, and currently I'm happy to report that nine countries have already um, now resume campaigns, and, and that's happened really in the last four weeks in different geographies within Africa and also in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, there are another five uh, countries that will resume responses um, by mid-October, um, and we anticipate that uh, as we learn more about the delivery of these, uh, unless we see some, some uh, negative signals related to this, then the, the remainder of countries will be planning uh, to do their rounds as, as quickly as they can. Um, I wanted to talk for a minute about the vaccines because uh, a lot of this talk so far has, has focused on sort of the impacts of COVID and, and, and having a tough year, um, but there's some good news on the vaccine front. Um, uh, we have been struggling um, with um, the amount of uh, type two containing live vaccine uh, that we've had in the program, uh, predominantly because we didn't uh, anticipate these outbreaks being as uh, pervasive as, as they have been five years after uh, the withdrawal of that vaccine globally. Um, however, um, you know, the, we have this situation where the path to getting out of these outbreaks is improving type two immunity and thereby using a lot of this vaccine. Uh, but because of the, the nature of the communities not having much protection and, and really having low levels of protection right now, um, when we use the vaccine, it risks uh, seeding additional uh, additional outbreaks. But there's a new product that's available, and so I just want to focus mostly on that on that lowest um, uh, line in the bottom table, and it's labeled NOPV2. Uh, and this is a brand new uh, polio vaccine that's about to go out uh, next month into the field. It's novel oral polio vaccine type two. Uh, it's still uh, works on a Sabin back back, uh, backbone, but it is a better attenuation. Um, and every, um, every uh, trial of it to date has, has suggests that it will have a much less likely chance of reverting and seeding these new outbreaks. And so we're really optimistic that this is going to be a, a really important tool for us to, to be able to not just stop the current outbreaks, but to prevent future outbreaks of type two 
uh, polio. Um, uh, and so um, this would have probably, in the absence of COVID, been one of the, the most rapid rollouts of a vaccine into the field from the time of emergency use listing uh, to roll out because we were intending to use a couple hundred million doses of it um, in, the, in, in, the, in the first year that we have it available. Of course, that's likely to now be eclipsed by COVID, but it still will represent one of the most rapid rollouts of a vaccine um, that, that has been done to date. Uh, and we uh, really are hopeful, uh, while we do that in a safe way, we really are hopeful that uh, it will become a, a critical tool to, to moving out of the, the current situation. Uh, this slide, I'm not gonna go into a lot of the detail on this slide. Uh, the point is, uh, the, the major point of the slide is that there's a huge amount of preparation that's already underway to be able to use this and use it quickly. Uh, and that includes uh, committees that are uh, briefing uh, different uh, regions and countries, uh, safety monitoring that's being put in place in uh, countries that we anticipate will be uh, using it early in the response, uh, and, um, and uh, all of the preparation of both the communities and the workforce to be able to deliver the vaccine. So what's next? Um, what I expect in the next uh, six months for polio is um, that, the, um, that they're gonna continue the, the pre-COVID work of modifying the program in Pakistan uh, with a real focus on, on uh, more efficient and, uh, management in some of the holdout geographies, as well as this new partnership uh, with the, the Pashtun community uh, that will allow us to, to, to hopefully gain trust of those communities and access them for vaccination. Um, there'll be a resumption of SIAs widely um, in Pakistan and Afghanistan. And as I mentioned, they'll be using trivalent OPV so that they can be simultaneously protecting kids against uh, the circulating type one wild virus and the circulating vaccine derived type two virus. Uh, in outbreak countries, we're already seeing a resumption of SIAs uh, and we hope that that will continue. And, and, if, and if it looks like everything is functioning as it should from a safety perspective, safety of the community, uh, that, that will accelerate. Um, and we'll be rapidly rolling out novel OPV2. Um, there'll be an initial use period that'll probably start in October or November and go on for a few months. Uh, and then very rapidly, we would hope, unless there's some sort of a negative sig signal that we don't anticipate right now, we will be rolling that out in many countries as quickly as we can. Um, all of this has impacted the financing of the Global Polio Eradication Initiative. And so um, at the last polio board meeting last month, the board stressed the need to, to continue to go out and advocate with donors for more resources and secure the funds that we need, uh, not just to get back uh, on track related to the COVID, um, uh, the COVID impacts on polio, but also to finish the job and, and, and finish it as quickly as we, as we can. Um, and so there's a big push for that, but also uh, a recognition that we have to, to also acknowledge the, 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 the world has uh, a resource constraint on the basis of COVID and really tighten the belt of the program and, and keep an eye on those things that we view as mission critical to get the job done, uh, not looking for all the bells and whistles, but those that critical path to eradication and then resourcing that critical path appropriately. Um, we're also undergoing a government a governance review within the partnership, and, and that's really designed to complement the, the technical work that'll come out of our new strategy development, which is that next line. Um, uh, with a new strategy and, a, and that critical path defined, we wanna make sure that the, that the management of the program is put together as efficiently as it can be um, in order to ensure that, uh, that we're delivering against those goals in a, in a rapid and effective way. I just wanted to stop and I don't know if Carol is presenting after me, but I just wanted to, I don't want to steal her thunder, but I thought it was a great moment. I don't know if any of you tuned into Times 100 uh, influential people for, uh, for the year, but Dr. Tunji uh, Funsho of Nigeria, who's a Rotarian and, and a really fabulous guy who I know um, from my time in Nigeria and work at the National EOC. He was recognized uh, as one of Times most influential people. Uh, in the world this year um, because of his efforts, the tire, tireless efforts to uh, stop 
polio transmission uh, in Nigeria. And so just a really great moment for, for Tunji and, 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 and just reminds us how critical Rotary is uh, to these efforts worldwide um, and, and how important the efforts of individual people can be uh, to get gain political and, and programmatic focus and get this done. So with that, I'd just like to thank you and, and I am available to answer any questions. If you would like, I will, uh, um, I guess I will stop sharing my screen um, so that I can see if the chat box, if there are any questions. Uh, thank you very much.